Okay, well, let me just start by asking, um, we've got some of these hopes up here. Did Jesus fulfill any of these hopes? If you think about Jesus' ministry, kind he of fed thing. the hungry. He fed the hungry, <laughs> okay. So we'll put a check mark. Jesus fed the hungry. <laughs> he raised up the little lady. He associated with anybody. Didn't okay. Matter who you are. So associated with with outcasts. We'll put it that way. Okay. But anybody actually, not just with outcasts yeah, actually. Was, was, also with the tax collectors. Yeah. So yes. you know the the and stink the prostitutes. and the prostitutes. Well, they were outcasts. They also had dinner also with the rich guys. Yeah. yeah. And the Pharisees, right? Yep. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the Pharisees couldn't figure out why he was eating with the tax collectors or the prostitutes, and the prostitutes couldn't figure out why he was eating with the Pharisees. And, I mean, there was, he just kind of, he defeated expectations and all ends in terms of whom he, he associated with. He did heal. And he healed the sick. We didn't have, that was one of the other expectations we had. What they else? judged no one, so... Okay, got two things there. So let's uh, put forgiveness down. So he, he he offered forgiveness. He judged no one. Is that true? No. 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 Yeah, but not just the tables in the in the temple. And he said people were going to end up getting thrown in the fire. I mean, it was interesting. He judged the people that nobody expected him to judge, right? I mean, he, he, he did this judging thing, but it was, well, he wasn't going around judging the Romans so much as judging those who call themselves descendants of Abraham, right? So he, he kind of did this topsy-turvy welcoming people in who shouldn't have been welcomed and then seeming to judge people who thought they should have been welcomed. He kind of turned that all around. We're going we're gonna to look at that uh, again in a moment. So the whole, um, throughout the Gospels, the whole question of who's in, who's out, how do you draw the boundaries, is turned completely upside down by Jesus. So you have a, you, have a, you know, First century Jewish society is pretty clear about who's acceptable to God and who's not acceptable to God. And these folks are in and these folks are out, you know, and, and, and that's all very clear. And Jesus spends a lot of time, so we're going to look at that too, redrawing those boundaries, saying who's in, who's out. And then in the book of Acts, the same thing happens, right? People, people that uh, even the early Christians thought shouldn't be welcomed in, like Gentiles without circumcision. Uh, no, no, they're going to be welcomed in. <laughs> you know, there's this kind of, throughout the Gospels, there's this kind of, again and again, this movement of, okay, okay, they can come in, but, but you know, not them. And you say, well, no, actually, they're in too. Oh, okay, but not them. No, no, actually, they're in too. <laughs> you know, it's this, and it's very disconcerting for people, right? And, and, and actually, this led to the struggles in the early church. You know, Paul and Peter are getting called on the carpet because you're, you're eating with who? And, and that was the charge against Jesus, right? In Luke 15, he's getting in trouble with the Pharisees because of whom he's eating with. And then you hear exactly that same charge against Peter in Acts. You know, he's, he's eating with Gentiles, right? And then Paul and Peter in Galatians. It's, uh, you know, what? You're eating with who? <laughs> you can't be doing that. And, and then in Corinthians... Paul's sort of saying, well, so we're having some debate about where you're allowed to eat and who you're allowed to eat with. And it just kind of, because who you eat with has to do with whether there's part of this holy kingdom. So Jesus is kind of, yeah, there's, there's judgment, but it's completely <laughs> not, not what people had expected. So what else? What else did Jesus do that fulfilled this expectation or this hope? Anything else? Confirmed resurrection. Okay, confirmed resurrection. And that's another thing that um, was kind of weird, right? <laughs> uh, because um, people expected a resurrection from the dead that would be all of Israel, everybody, you know, that when the day of resurrection, everybody will, will be raised. And this is, I think, why the disciples didn't believe the story that the women told, because it wasn't supposed to happen that way. So 
one person being raised from the dead? <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is not how it's supposed to go. And, and, and it, it's not the case that, gee, in the first century, people were more gullible, and so that's why they believed in the resurrection. But we're more sophisticated, so we don't believe people, right? I mean, people in the first century knew that you didn't raise from the, people didn't come back from the dead, right? So, that's, uh, so yeah, I mean, and, and it's just disbelief across the board. The disciples did not believe it either at first. Um, because it was supposed to be this big end time thing. Um, and so Jesus himself rose from the dead and said, this is what it's going to look like. So he didn't really but confirm resurrection. He, he, oh, how could you say it? Because it's, it's, like, it's, it's like his judgment. It's not what they expected. <laughs> it's not what they expected. That's right. So he, I mean, the Bible talks about it as Jesus being the firstborn from the dead, right? There's... Um, you know, God's kingdom has broken in, but it's not completely here yet. It's that, you know, some theologians talk about it as the already, not yet. The kingdom's already here, but not quite yet, right? And that's what how Jesus' resurrection functions. We'll say more about that next next week, actually. What else? What he gave hope to the people. Okay, so I don't know if we have hope up here, but I'll put it some here. What about, um, let's see, saving them from their enemies? Yeah, was that. I was thinking about the, all the sword talk, all the sword. Which, is, which is always kind of alarming. Mm -hmm. um, I come to bring a sword. Um, yeah, not peace, but a sword. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, but the confronting the enemies is also the, uh, being, well, sort of the being on the cross. Um, okay. That there's that sense of, of that that's the ultimate confrontation. But it's, again, it's what John is pointing out. It's the upside down, backwards kind of confrontation. That's right. Seeming yeah. to submit to this thing, but it's mm -hmm. it's the ultimate it's confrontation. Right? Yeah. So, so, you know, Jesus doesn't make the Romans just the enemies. Um, Jesus comes to deal with the enemy in Israel's midst, which is Satan dealing at the heart of Israel, too, right? And so you have Jesus. Jesus encounters Satan in the desert. There's the temptations. And then the exorcisms going throughout Jesus' ministry, which is Jesus throwing, you know, dealing with evil in Israel's midst. So the enemy is not you know, those guys. <laughs> but the, Jesus is saying the enemy, is, the enemy is in the heart of all of us, right? Yeah. Cuts down the heart of all of us. And so Jesus is, and, and on the cross, you're right, that's where Jesus is ultimately dealing with evil, ultimately dealing with Satan, ultimately confronting Satan. So what happens is, um, I don't know if we had, uh, can't, we had, you know, when the king, this king who's going to be on the throne of David, where is Jesus enthroned, but on a cross, right? That's where Jesus rules. That's where Jesus deals with evil. That is the enemy in Israel's midst. So there's all, so, so yes, uh, Jesus is fulfilling those hopes, is dealing with evil, but in a, a way completely differently than the people thought. And so the conventional language about enemies, when Jesus talks about enemies, what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. Love your enemies, right? Um, pray for those who persecute you. Well, maybe that's Paul. No, it's Jesus too. Um, <laughs> love your enemies. So there's this whole different way of thinking about who the enemy is um, that, that Jesus has. But is that not Jesus' way of opening up our eyes to the fact that just because you're a Roman, it, because the Jews were kind of doing that, but you had to be this caste, Mm -hmm. But just because you were a Roman doesn't mean you're an enemy because the woman, the child, whatever. Mm -hmm. the, so the enemy is the evilness that people are acting out, not just because you're a Roman. Just It's just mm -hmm. a, it's, Jesus comes in and gives us God's real teachings. Mm -hmm. And he's. Well, I think, I think maybe another way to put that is, um, yeah, somebody's not just an enemy because they're a Roman or because they're a Gentile or because they're a Samaritan. You get all these over yeah. things. Um, but uh, 
Jesus is challenging the injustice at the heart yeah, of exactly. Israelite society itself in all different places, right? So this is one of the problems with the Pharisees yeah. is, you know, they, they bind these heavy burdens, Jesus says, which are some of them economic burdens on people. And, and when, when uh, um, but, but even I think, uh, even there, uh, I think Jesus isn't saying, you know, um, love Romans who are good Romans, right? <laughs> love enemies yeah, who are good yeah, enemies, yeah. right? Yeah. There's, it's, it's more than that, too. Yeah. He's not saying some Romans are good people, so you should love them. And, you know, it's, it's wider what, what he's saying there. We'll look at a couple passages that talk about this, actually. Um, let, me, let me put up one, one, um, one more thing here. And uh, I don't know if we had it up here or not. Um, well, we didn't actually mention the rich. <laughs> I mean, it's this interesting thing about Mary's song, right, which talks about the hungry uh, being, the, the lowly being lifted up and the rich sent away hungry. Um, and it's pretty uncompromising language. And it's language that Jesus echoes again and again. I mean, in Luke, he actually says three times. You know, we, we tend to think that the only time he said, every, sell everything you have and give it to the poor was for, when he was talking to the rich ruler. But he's actually said it twice before that to everybody. Uh, so there's this, um, so there is this kind of reversal in the Gospels too, where Jesus is saying, you know, those who follow me will become poor, right? There's this, the rich will be sent away hungry. I mean, and this, this you have this in the Beatitudes. Woe to you who are filled now, for you will be hungry. Actually, wasn't that the reading this past Sunday? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and blessed are you if you're hungry now, for you will be filled. And so this is a theme that Jesus picks up. Um, but you don't actually get that kind of reversal. It's like, no, this is pretty straight up, <laughs> what Jesus says. And so we'll look at, at that, too. Okay, let's look at a few passages, because it's always... Uh, to get kind of the big picture, but then to focus in. So let's look at Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning at verse 16. Luke 4, verse 16. This is, um, <clears throat> this is Jesus uh, coming to Nazareth, and it's generally thought to be Jesus' first sermon, which is really short. Uh, verse 16. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? <laughs> Wait a minute, we know this guy's father. He can't possibly be this kid. Um, so Jesus, uh, this, this quotation uh, that begins, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, is from Isaiah 61. Um, last week I put a passage up on the board, Isaiah 60 verse 1 to 61 verse 3 or something. This was what was in there. <laughs> we skipped. Um, it's a passage about... Uh, about Jubilee, actually, about the time when captives would be released, debts would be forgiven um, in, in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is talking about how that time has come. Good news for the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. So this sounds like these texts that talk about this new so social order, right? Um, Jesus leaves something off in the uh, in the prophecy. In Isaiah 61, what it says at the end of to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, there's an and. And the next line is, and the day of vengeance of our God. So not just God's favor, 
but vengeance. And of course, who would that vengeance be on except those foreign powers that are oppressing God's people? So did Jesus leave that off on purpose? Did people notice he left it off? They might have just thought he stopped reading it. Now, Jesus, I think, left it off on purpose, and here's why I think that. He goes on to make it clear that he's left it off, this, the language of vengeance. Verse 23, he said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Do you know this story? Um, so Elijah uh, is in the desert. There's a famine. Birds have been feeding him, and he's next to a little wadi, a brook which dries up, uh, and he starts to tell God that he'd like to just die now. And uh, God instead tells him no, <laughs> not time for that yet. And so he goes and he finds this widow and asks her to bake him something. And she says, I have just enough oil and meal for one last, last cake for my son and I, and then we're going to die. And Elijah says, well, go and bake a cake for me. A cake, I'm talk not talking about like a birthday cake, but a little, <laughs> a little round uh, cake. And, uh, and she does, as, and as long as Elijah is with her, she never runs out of oil, and she never runs out of meal, out of, out of kind of a coarsely ground flour. Um, and Jesus is saying, there were lots of hungry Israelite widows, but this was a non-Israelite widow that Elijah was sent to. So you can see his hearers kind of thinking, uh-huh, <laughs> what's that supposed to mean? And then he goes on. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. I don't know if you know the story from 2 Kings 5 of Naaman the Syrian. Um, Naaman, the foreign military commander who, uh, who had leprosy, and a little slave girl and he is captured from Israel, tells him he can go to Israel and be healed, right? So this is a guy who's stealing little Israelite girls, and he goes for healing, and Elisha heals him, right? He doesn't, the way Jesus says it is, he didn't heal any lepers in Israel, just a Syrian guy who's been stealing God, children. the Israelite girl that told him to go. Yes. So, I mean, she obviously felt he was worth something. Well, that's an interesting point, that, that, that the Israelite slave girl uh, told him to go, so she felt he was worth something, yes. It's, it's actually a story, if you read it, that all the action happens because of the servants. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really... Um, so, what's Jesus saying? He's left off this bit about vengeance, and then he says that this Jubilee text, which was supposed to be for, for Israelites, is it's for Gentiles. It's a whole new ballgame. <laughs> and the thing is, they have clued in that that's what he's talking about, that he left that stuff about vengeance on on purpose because when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. It's like, oh my goodness. He's actually saying that this day of the Lord's favor is for Gentiles. And they got up, drove him out of the town, led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they might hurl him off the cliff. I mean, they're going to kill him. They're so mad. It's like, this is not what the good news is, Jesus, uh, at all. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. So he's transforming. He's coming with this good news. He's fulfilling these hopes, but he's just transforming it. It's not just for Israel. It's for Gentiles as well. Um, you know, you get a, so, so we're looking at a few passages now which show how Jesus kind of fulfilled things, but not quite the way they expected, right? So let's look at another one, Matthew 15. Some of you who've taken some classes with me have, have heard me do a couple of these before. Matthew 15. Um, 
This is just after a feeding of the uh, 5,000 in Matthew 14. And then Matthew 15, verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So um, Tyre and Sidon is kind of on this outdated map we have here, is, um, is up here. And that's why she, uh, this woman is sometimes called the Syrophoenician woman because you have Phoenicia up here. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out a Canaanite woman. Now, the word Canaanite wasn't used at this time anymore. There was a Syrophoenician woman, or you might talk about a Syrian, but you wouldn't talk about a Canaanite. There were no Canaanites anymore, right? So this would be like saying to, you know, introducing Diane's husband, Al, and saying, here's Alan, he's a Viking, <laughs> right? Because his ancestors are from Scandinavia. It's like, no, you wouldn't do that anymore. You wouldn't cut, well, you might want to call out if I can, I don't know. <laughs> but that's, that's not how, it would not It would be anachronistic to introduce them that way, right? Or somebody from France, you would say, you know, here is Jean, and he's from Gaul. No, it doesn't make sense, unless you read asterisks, and, then, and it does. But Canaanite didn't make sense at this time anymore. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Now you need to understand that the Canaanites were considered to kind of epitomize, excuse me, <coughs> epitomize those who were against God, the heathen nations. And in Deuteronomy 7, there's actually a listing of seven heathen nations, seven pagan nations. And the Israelites are told not to have mercy. Do not have mercy on any of these nations. So when this woman's called a Canaanite, that's Matthew using a word for her that would, 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 would you know, raise the antenna. This is a heathen. And what she comes and says is, have mercy on me, Lord. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And he doesn't answer her at all. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, passage in detail here, though I think there's this kind of movement back and forth. He, it, it actually, it says in the Greek, it doesn't say he didn't answer her. It's just he didn't answer. And then when he does speak, it's he says, but it's not clear that it's to her. Um, and then she gives him this witty answer. When he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, she says, um, or when he answers, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, she has this witty answer. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So there's this, it's hard to know in the biblical text what the tone is sometimes. Like we tend to think that Jesus was always dead serious, but really I don't think tax collectors and sinners were having a good time with him if he was always dead serious. I think there must be levity sometimes. And is this one of those passages? Does her response indicate that Jesus spoke to her first with a smile? I, I don't know <laughs> what's, what's, how, how, this, how this shook out. But when she makes this comment about the crumbs, she knows he's just fed 5,000 people and there were 12 baskets left over. She knows that. And so she has said, even the dogs eat the crumbs. And Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. So you have this woman who's Canaanite, heathen, um, who has great faith. Now what's interesting about this little, little passage is it is framed. Just before this event, Jesus feeds 5,000 and there are 12 baskets left over. What are those 12 baskets generally what are they generally thought to symbolize? Twelve tribes of Israel. This is, everybody knows this. If you, they know nothing about survival, they know this. <laughs> Twelve tribes of Israel. Right after this, verse 32 of chapter of Mark 15, Jesus feeds 4,000. Both of these, Matthew uh, is careful to tell us that these are numbers that don't include women and children, which is Usually that's assumed. It's kind of nice he, t he tells us this. So 4,000 plus women and children. So 8,000? I don't know how many women or children would have been along for the ride. But uh, anyway, Jesus feeds another enormous amount of people. And this time, 
There are seven baskets left over. Verse 37. Do those seven baskets then represent those seven heathen nations of Deuteronomy 7? Maybe they do. Um, if the 12 or the 12 tribes of Israel, is that what the and in Acts, how many deacons are appointed to look after the Gentile widows, the Hellenistic widows? But seven deacons uh, for the non-Jewish <laughs> widows who need care. I think there's I think this this works in terms of this this story is a point where in Jesus' ministry that feeding, that welcome is opened up to those who were thought of as the people opposed to God, right? Those characterized by the Canaanites, Diane. Well, how would that relate to um, the seven times seven, but the number of the heathen nations? Mm -hmm. Does that link at all? Because seven had more to do with completion. Yeah, seven, so seven was a number of fullness and completion. For, so when there are seven nations, uh, heathen nations listed, it's generally thought to, you know, those seven, that summarizes all of the heathen nations. But there were in that command seven. Um, and, uh, and so this seven baskets, I think, echoes that bit from Deuteronomy, just happens to be chapter seven, and, um, but also is a sense of fullness and completeness as well. So yeah, 12 was the number of fullness for Israel, <laughs> and, and seven has a wider uh, fullness and completeness sense. So yeah, the Sabbath was on the seventh day, the Sabbath year was the seventh year, and the seven times seven, at the end of that is the year of Jubilee as well. But it was such a recurring number for the yeah. Israelites, the sevens. Well, that's right. Um, and that's why 666 is, is uh, you know, the number of the Antichrist, because it's not quite seven, right? And it can never get to seven. I don't know if they knew that back then. <laughs> I don't think decimal points were. <laughs> <laughs> it did math that way. So those are two passages that kind of show how, oh, okay, the boundaries, the boundaries are shifting here. Um, but let's look at another one, Luke chapter 10. You'll recognize uh, this story from Luke 10. Uh, we're going to begin at verse 25. Actually, just before that, we have the mission of the 70. So there's <laughs> that seven again. Um, so uh, Luke 10, verse 25, the Good Samaritan. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. And a lawyer means somebody who's, who's trained in, in the law of the scriptures, right? In, in Jewish law. Teacher, he said... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let me just say, his question isn't how do I get to heaven? He's working within that Jewish worldview that God will come and establish the kingdom on earth, right? So how do I inherit eternal life? How can I be part of this coming kingdom that God will establish? And actually, eternal life is literally in Greek, life into the ages. So how can I have life into the ages, ongoing life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. It's kind of this, that's all you have to do. <laughs> no trouble. But wanting to justify himself, so wanting to be righteous could be another <laughs> translation there. Uh, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now there were certain acceptable Jewish answers to this question, right? Um, you know, your neighbor was other faithful Jews. Um, in some traditions, your neighbor was uh, a morally good Gentile. Um, but, you know, it, had a, it always had kind of a boundary, right, that you didn't have to go beyond in terms of who was your neighbor. 
And then Jesus replied with this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, now I should say, um, in the ancient world, it was easy to tell what, where people were from by their clothing, because certain villages in Judea, different villages would have different clothing. It was easy to tell where people were from by their accent, if they spoke. So when Peter, you remember when Peter's in the courtyard after, after the, at the time of the crucifixion, and you know somebody recognizes him because he sounds like a Galilean, right? You could. So this man who's been stripped and beat and left half dead, nobody knows who he is. If he's Jew, if he's Gentile, if he's Roman, there's no way of knowing. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And there might have been all kinds of reasons he did that. If he was dead, the priest would have become unclean by touching him. And corpse uncleanliness lasted a week and involved very serious <laughs> rituals to become clean again. So a priest would not be able to continue his service in the temple if he touched a corpse. So. There was that threat. Also in the ancient world, if you went and helped somebody who'd been beaten up, there was a chance that you also could be beaten up by the robbers who were just waiting for somebody to come and help. <laughs> okay, we'll get them too. But there also, this is a, a culture of, um, of retaliation. It could be that you helped somebody and in helping them became a target for retaliation for what had happened to them. So, there was, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as straightforward as it can be today to help somebody. Carol? But don't priests have to keep their garments clean if they're going to the temple? Well, and for him to bend down, he would... That's part of it. I mean, pre actually, priests having clean garments at the temple wasn't so essential because priests were actually glorified butchers, right? Okay. I mean, what, what are they going to do when they get to the temple? Yeah, they're right. going to start sacrificing yeah. animals and cutting open birds, and so they're, they're going to be okay. dirty pretty quick. But it's the ritual uncleanliness that's more important. Okay. But he also doesn't know if this is a Jew or a Gentile, right? He has no idea who this is. So there were, this doesn't make, this isn't to excuse the priest, but, no. you know. Um, so likewise, the Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by the other side. Now. In the ancient world, and in the Middle East in general, if, the other thing is you know if somebody's traveling along a road, you know who's ahead of you. Because when the Levite stopped, he would have said, did anybody else go down this road ahead of me? Because <laughs> it's not a safe road from Jerusalem to Jericho, right? He probably knows if the priest was ahead of him, he knows the priest passed by. If the priest was coming the other way, the priest might have told him. There's this guy at the side of the road. <laughs> you might not want it. Um, so the Levite comes along, and for probably much the same reasons, doesn't uh, help. Passes by the other side. Now here comes the Samaritan. Came near him and saw him. He was moved with pity. Now here's the thing. The Samaritan had all the same reasons for not stopping. It was just as dangerous for him to stop. There's also fear of retaliation. And Samaritans followed the, the purity laws too. He also could have become unclean if he was dead. But the Samaritan stops and is moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Now here's the thing, if the guy in the ditch was a Jew, he wouldn't have wanted a Samaritan to touch him. He would have been deeply offended that a Samaritan touched him. Jews considered Samaritans to be deeply immoral. Um, one way I illustrated this uh, when I wrote an article on it a long, long time ago now was that if, you guys might be old enough to know this illustration, it would be like, Somebody gets beat up and they're lying on the side of the road and Hugh Hefner, you know who Hugh Hefner is? <laughs> you did, I knew you were at the right age for this. <laughs> you know, showed up and picked you up and kind of, you know, took you, took you to the bed where all kinds of other stuff goes on and wrapped you up and looked after you. I mean, you might think, 
I'd rather be dead in a ditch, right? I don't want this person looking at This person is deeply immoral. I don't want them looking after me. Um, that's how a Jew would have felt about a Samaritan helping them. They'd rather die than have a Samaritan help them. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, and it's interesting, the lawyer can't even say the Samaritan, it seems. He says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And the point of this parable isn't so much, it seems to me, it isn't so much Jesus saying, we need to be a neighbor to people we, we would not normally help. I think the point of the parable is Jesus saying, you have to learn from the person that you think is morally inferior how to be a neighbor, right? That the Samaritan is actually teaching this Jewish lawyer what it is to be a neighbor. I mean, it's, it's far more radical than the just help the person you don't want to help. But maybe that person that you consider to be outside the pale has something to teach you about what it is to follow Jesus. That's, that's kind of uh, pushing the boundary even further <laughs> than any, any first century Jew would have wanted to push it. Are there any questions about, about that one? It's, so Jesus so far has, uh, in Luke 4, sort of just widened it generally to the Gentiles. Uh, you know, in, in, in uh, Matthew 14, sort of talked about these Canaanites, these heathens, these God-haters, these idolaters. Uh, in um, uh, Luke 10, now the Samaritans who, like, doesn't he get it? They're just, they don't measure up. Um, and then, let's look at Luke 15, just a little bit on. And sometimes it's interesting to just read... You can even just do it with Luke, to just kind of read through and just kind of jot down, okay, now who gets in? Now who gets in? It's kind of particularly in Acts. So Luke 15 begins with all the tax collectors and sinners coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, in verse 2, were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Right? That's the big charge. He's welcoming these sinners and he's eating with them. And then Jesus tells some parables. There's the one of the lost sheep, and the lost coin, and the lost son. These, are, these have all been in our lectionary readings in the last few months. So I'm going to look at the lost son for a minute. <clears throat> Jesus said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. Of course, that's as if the son at that time is saying, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. So he divided his property between him, which was a very shameful thing for his father to have done. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had, which means he sold the property he was given, right? He wasn't given cash. He was given land and animals. So he sold all that and traveled to a distant country and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. I love that phrase, dissolute living. Later, his older brother says that he's squandered it on hookers. So that's probably what dissolute living means. When he had spent, what does your Bible say, Diane? The Jerusalem? A life of debauchery. A life of debauchery. Oh, that's good, too. <laughs> that's a life of debauchery. These would be great phrases for, like, birthday cards or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Have a great birthday. Do some dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired him out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. And of course, this is very ironic because pigs were unclean for Jews, right? So he's in the most unclean place he could be. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. It's a little disingenuous because his father's hired hands would have done just fine, right? Uh, they, they would have been fed. So he sent off and went to his father. 
But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Now, if you know anything about ancient Near Eastern culture, you know that this was just not done. I mean, this father should have actually turned his back on this son who had so deeply shamed him. Um, but to run, to hoist up his skirts and run through the village and, and kiss him, uh, you know, this father has no sense of propriety and no sense of honor. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to him, to his slaves, quickly bring a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The father uses resurrection language, right? He's dead and now he's alive. Now. His elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has gotten back safe and sound. Then the elder son became angry, refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. This is another really shameful thing, right? The whole village is there, and they know that the son won't go in. And the father ends up having to go out. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. And his father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Again, it's resurrection language was at the end of there. And I think this this parable kind of gathers together these these other stories about kind of this, you know, how judgment is overturned in the text, right? Everybody would have expected that younger, disobedient son to have been the one who was judged, right? And instead, he's welcomed back. It's this, I mean, it's a text of, here it is, of radical forgiveness, right? Just this totally unexpected forgiveness, even, even after he has destroyed everything in his father's honor and, the, you know, sold the land and this incredible forgiveness and welcome. And that elder son, I mean, the story is left open, right? What happens? Does he go in or not? Um, a, a priest, uh, one of the priests um, who taught me a lot about preaching, Ansley Tucker, ended this one story once. She was preaching on it by saying, did he go in or not? And then she said, did you? That was the end of the sermon. <laughs> it was this kind of, are you, are you willing to be part of this kind of a kingdom? Are you willing to, to be part of a kingdom where everyone is welcome, even those you don't want to be at the table with? Are you willing to come in? Because that's what Jesus has done. He's turned it all upside down. Um, and, and the ones that you really don't want to sit there with, no, that's... That's who's going to be part of this kingdom. And for the younger son, it might have been the older son. <laughs> but the, for the older son, who feels like, I've done everything right. I've done all the work. I've never complained. I didn't go squander my property in debauchery. Was that <laughs> the phrase? Or dis dissolute living? I didn't do any of those things. You know, I'm good. I'm good, Jesus. Saying, well, but are you good enough to want to come and share the table with these other people? who are. So there's, it's this interesting thing Jesus does with the hope, the hope that we saw from last week and earlier in this passage. There's, Jesus comes and there is this, this complete fulfillment of, of all this hope for peace, 
um, you know, for reconciliation between all these people who weren't getting along, for welcome, for forgiveness, for the poor being fed, for, you know, we're going to see how the early church interpreted this next week in terms of a complete economic restructuring. There's all of this. And then there's this twist <laughs> of, okay, it's all come true now, but not for the people you expected it to be for and not quite in the way you expected it either. And are you willing to be a part of that? Well, it's five past, um, and we're going to end with week 19. In a moment. But this gets us back to that throne <laughs> of David and what it looked like when somebody came to sit on that throne. Verse 29 of Luke 19. When Jesus had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. I love it that that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay then. <laughs> you take it then. <laughs> then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples, get that, the whole multitude of the disciples, in other words, 12 of them, began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the, now it was probably more than just 12 of them. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. So, here comes the king, the king who comes in the name of the Lord, and he's coming in on a colt. He's not coming in on a war horse. Uh, he's not coming in in a chariot. In fact, this is right before the Passover. And because the Passover was the celebration of Jewish liberation from Egypt, Rome sent reinforcements every year so that there would not be a revolt in Jerusalem at this time. So probably at the time that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem at one gate with a coal on the colt, probably there were some troops coming in on horses, war horses, at the other gate. That, that's not unlikely, because that would have been happening that week beforehand. And so that's the contrast. How does Jesus rule? How does Jesus come as king? Jesus comes as a servant, not on a war horse, not to impose rule through military might, but he comes to be king on the cross, to wear a crown that's a crown of thorns. So you have this whole fulfillment of Jewish hope in this completely different way, uh, this way of the suffering servant, the way of suffering death. So is the hope for a king fulfilled? Yes. <laughs> is the evil defeated? Yes but not the way anybody was expecting. Uh, is that why some of the Jewish people believe he was not the Messiah, that the Messiah still has to come? Well, there's probably all kinds of reasons why people believe Jesus wasn't the Messiah, but that could be one of them, yes, because the Messiah was not supposed to die. But, yeah. like, I mean, his teachings were so topsy-turvy. Could oh. that be why the... Oh, that would be part of it. I mean, you know, after, uh, after Jesus in the, in the early church, um, well, let me rephrase it this way. Um, the whole story of Israel and, and of, of Judaism was a story in which certain things were central, right? God's covenant, yeah. covenant faithfulness, God's election, and law, the law, Torah. Um, Jesus, 
was cursed by the law, right? <clears throat> Died on a tree. And the early church, there was this big struggle within the early church for how the story would continue. How was God faithful? Was God faithful through Jesus? Um, was the law necessary? And for many Jews in the first century, uh, the answer of the church that the law was no longer necessary meant that this was no longer Judaism and you couldn't be Jewish any, any longer. So, so that would be that would be one of the one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why 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 Jews uh, might not have accepted Jesus, but but others did, right? There was like it was a both and in the first in the first century. Yes, but that's a good question. So, um, last week we kind of looked at Old Testament expectation. And this week we looked at kind of expectation in Jesus' time and then how Jesus might have fill, fulfilled that. Next week we're going to look at post-resurrection expectation. We'll say some more about the resurrection and then look at the early church and what were people hoping for and what were people waiting for. And then we'll also spend next week some time sort of talking about what are our hopes and expectations as people of God? What do we wait for? You know, when we go through those four weeks of Advent and we're saying, Amen, come Lord Jesus, what are we asking for? <laughs> what are we waiting for? As we light those candles every week, what are our longings and our hopes? And how does that fit in with, with biblical hope and biblical expectation?